Hey friends, Miss Rosenfield here. We're gonna read the Cyclops section from your textbook. Remember that it is volume two, and we are reading page 564 to 576. This is a pretty long section, but there's a lot that goes on, so I hope you like it. Um, I'll stop periodically and point out figurative language and explain what's going on. So where we pick up, remember Odysseus is telling the story of what has gone on for the past 10 years to King Alcinous. And he first started with leaving Troy and landing at Ismeris with the land of the Sicones, where he raided their castle and then they fought him back. And then going to the land of the Lotus Eaters where his men ate the Lotus and wanted to stay there, but he had to drag them away. And now he's going to meet Polyphemus the Cyclops. He doesn't know that yet, um, but Polyphemus is Poseidon's son. So that ends up being pretty important. So I am starting in the middle of page 564 where it says the Cyclops. In the next land we found were Cyclops, giants, louts, without a law to bless them. In ignorance, leaving the fruitage of the earth in a mystery to the immortal gods, they neither plow nor sow by hand, nor till the ground, though grain, wild wheat and barley, grows untended, and wine grapes in clusters ripen in heaven's rains. Cyclops have no muster and no meeting, no consultation or old tribal ways, but each one dwells in his own mountain cave, dealing out rough justice to wife and child, indifferent to what the others do. So he's giving us some background about the Cyclops. They're really dumb. They don't do anything as far as farming or having like a society with morals and customs, and they're pretty violent. As we rode on and nearer to the mainland, at one end of the bay, we saw a cavern yawning above the water, screened with laurel. So there's an example of personification, a cavern yawning. Obviously, that's a human trait. Caverns don't yawn. It's a cave. But he's telling us how the cave looks like it's opening wide. And many rams and goats about the place inside a sheepfold, made from slabs of stone earth fast between tall trunks of pine and rugged towering oak trees. A prodigious man slept in this cave alone and took his flocks to graze a field, remote from all companions, knowing none but savage ways, a brute so huge he seemed no man at all of those who eat good wheat and bread, but he seemed rather a shaggy mountain reared in solitude. So here's a metaphor. Odysseus is saying the Cyclops is so big that he's um, a mountain. We beached there, and I told the crew to stand by and keep watch over the ship. As for myself, I took my 12 best fighters and went ahead. I had a goatskin full of that sweet liquor that Euanthe's son Marin had given me. He kept Apollo's holy grove at Ismaris. For kindness we showed him there, and showed his wife and child. He gave me seven shining golden talents perfectly formed, a solid silver wine bowl, and then this liquor, twelve two-handled jars of brandy, pure and fiery. Not a slave in Marin's household knew this drink. Only he, his wife, and the storeroom mistress knew, and they would put one cup full, ruby-colored, honey-smooth, in twenty more of water. But still the sweet scent hovered like a fume over the wine bowl. No man turned away when cups of this came round. So... <clears throat> Odysseus' friend had given him and his men this really powerful wine. Um, he calls it brandy, but then he calls it wine later. So I'm just going to call it wine. <coughs> Excuse me. And this wine is so powerful that the people who make it dilute it one cup of wine to 20 cups of water. And it's still so strong that when they hand it out to people, everybody wants a cup. So they gave him some, and that's what he's bringing with him to Polyphemus' cave. A wineskin full I brought along, and victuals in a bag, for in my bones I knew some towering brute would be upon us soon, all outward power, a wild man, ignorant of civility. We climbed then briskly to the cave, but Cyclops had gone afield to pasture his fat sheep, so we looked round at everything inside. A drying rack that sagged with cheeses, pens crowded with lambs and kids, each in its class, firstlings apart from middlings, and the dewdrops, or newborn lambkins, penned apart from both and vessels full of whey were brimming there, bowls of earthenware and pails for milking. My men came pressing round me, pleading, why not take these cheeses, get them stowed, come back, throw open all the pens and make a run for it. We'll drive the kids and lambs aboard. We say put out again on good salt water. So <clears throat> they go up to the cave where Polyphemus lives, and he keeps sheep there, and he makes cheese, and they see all these sheep and all this cheese, and his men say, 
listen, he's not here. Let's just grab all these animals and this food and get out of here. But Odysseus doesn't listen to them. He wants to stay and meet Polyphemus. Ah, how sound that was, meaning that's a good idea, but he's still not going to follow their advice. Yet I refused. I wished to see the caveman, what he had to offer. And now I'm at the top of page 566. No pretty sight, it turned out, for my friends. So that's some foreshadowing. It, what, what happens to his friends isn't pretty. We lit a fire, burnt an offering, and took some cheese to eat, then sat in silence around the embers, waiting. When he came, he had a load of dry boughs on his shoulder to stoke his fire at supper time. And you can see on the picture on the next page that here is Polyphemus holding all these trees that are gigantic trees to humans, but are reasonable to him for his fire. He dumped it with a great crash into that hollow cave, and we all scattered fast to the far wall. Then over the broad cavern floor, he ushered the ewes he meant to milk. He left his rams and he goats in the yard outside and swung high overhead a slab of solid rock to close the cave. Two dozen four-wheeled wagons with heaving wagon teams could not have stirred the tonnage of that rock from where he wedged it over the door sill. So over the entrance of the cave, he has a giant boulder that he moves as the door. And it's easy for him to move because he's a cyclops, but no humans, no group of humans could move this boulder. That's how big it is. Next, he took his seat and milked his bleeding ewes. A practice job he made of it, giving each ewe her suckling, thickened his milk, then into curds and whey, sieved out the curds to drip in withy baskets, and poured the whey to stand in bowls, cooling until he drank it for supper. When all these chores were done, he poked the fire, heaping on brushwood. In the glare, he saw us. Strangers, he said, who are you and where from? What brings you here by seaways, a fair traffic? Or are you wandering rogues who cast your lives like dice and ravage other folk by sea? We felt a pressure on our hearts in dread of that deep rumble in that mighty man. But all the same, I spoke up in reply. We are from Troy, Achaeans. He doesn't mean that they came from Troy. He means that that's where they most recently were. So they're sailing from Troy. Um, but the, they're Achaeans as people. And uh, Ithaca is where Odysseus is from. Blown off course by shifting gales on the great South Sea. And I'm on line 206 now. Homeward bound, but taking routes and ways uncommon. So the will of Zeus would have it. We served under Agamemnon, son of Atreus. The whole world knows what city he laid waste, what armies he destroys. And he uh, destroyed, and that means Troy, that they destroyed Troy. It was our luck to come here. Here we stand, beholden for your help, or any gifts you give, as custom is to honor strangers. We would entreat you, great sir, have a care for the gods' courtesy. Zeus will avenge the unoffending guest. So it was a thing for ancient Greeks to be very hospitable and friendly to any guests that might come by, even if they were unexpected, because Zeus was said to watch over guests. So if someone came to your house and needed food or a place to stay and you turn them away, then you risk offending Zeus. And as we all know, upsetting the gods is the worst thing and Zeus is the most powerful god, so you don't want to do that. And there's also the undertone that any guest could be Zeus in disguise, so you need to treat guests politely. So Odysseus is asking Polyphemus to be hospitable um, and Polyphemus doesn't care about Zeus. I'm on page 567 now. He answered this from his brute chest, unmoved. You are a ninny, or else you come from the other end of nowhere, telling me mine the gods. We Cyclops care not a whistle for your thundering Zeus or all the gods in bliss. We have more force by far. I would not let you go for fear of Zeus, you or your friends, unless I had a whim to. Tell me, where was it now you left your ship? Around the point or down the shore, I wonder? So Polyphemus knows that there's probably a ship that brought them there, and Odysseus doesn't want him to go kill those men and destroy it, so he lies to him and tells him that the ship is gone. He thought he'd find out, but I saw through this and answered with a ready lie. My ship? Poseidon Lord, who sets the earth a-tremble, broke it up on the rocks at your land's end. A wind from seaward served him, drove us there. We are survivors, these good men and I. And um, you'll notice that Odysseus is very tricky throughout, and especially with Polyphemus the Cyclops. I'm at the top of page 568 now. Neither reply nor pity came from him, but in one stride he clutched at my companions and caught two in his hands like squirming puppies to beat their brains out, spattering the floor. Then he dismembered them and made his meal, gaping and crunching like a mountain lion. So he grabbed two of the sailors, smashed them against the rock, and ate them. And Odysseus is using a simile that he's eating like a mountain lion to describe how brutally he's eating these men. 
everything, innards, flesh, and marrow bones. We cried aloud, lifting our hands to Zeus, powerless, looking on at this, appalled. But Cyclops went on, filling up his belly with man flesh in great gulps of whey. So he's like eating human, drinking milk. Then lay down like a mast among his sheep. My heart, beat be my heart beat high now at the chance of action, and drawing the sharp sword from my hip, I went along his flank to stab him, where the midriff holds the liver. I had touched the spot when sudden fear stayed me. If I killed him, we perished there as well, for we could never move his ponderous doorway slab aside. So we were left to groan and wait for morning. So he's about to go kill Polythemus, kind of puts his sword up to him, and then realizes that if he kills him, they can't move the boulder off the entrance of the cave. So they die there because they're stuck inside the cave. So it has to come up with a different plan. I'm in the middle of 568 now at line 252. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose lit up the world, so more personification comparing dawn, the beginning of the day to a person, the Cyclops built a fire and milked his handsome ewes all in due order, putting the sucklings to the mothers. Then, his chores being all dispatched, he caught another brace of men to make his breakfast and whisked away his great door slab to let his sheep go through. So he ate two more men for breakfast. But he, behind, reset the stone as one would cap a quiver. There was a din of whistling as the cyclops rounded his flock to higher ground, then stillness. And now I pondered how to hurt him worst, if but Athena granted what I prayed for. So he left for the day, but he closed the door to the cave behind him. So Odysseus and his men are still stuck there. Here are the means I thought would serve my turn. A club or staff lay there along the fold, an olive tree, felled green and left to season for Cyclops' hand. And it was like a mast, a lugger of twenty oars, broad in the beam, a deep seagoing craft might carry. So long, so big around it seemed. Now I chopped out a six-foot section of this pole and set it down before my men, who scraped it. And when they had it smooth, I hewed again to make a stake with pointed end. I held this in the fire's heart and turned it, toughening it then hid it well back in the cavern under one of the dung piles and grow fusion there. So Odysseus and his men are, they take a log that's in Polyphemus's cave and they've carved the end of it so that it's like a spike. And then they're turning it in the, uh, uh, in the fire so that it becomes hard and won't splinter when they use it. And they're about to use it to poke out Polyphemus's eye. And he only has one. I'm at the top of page 569. And in the meantime, they're hiding it in a pile of poop so when they do poke out his eye, he'll have poop on it. Now came the time to toss for it. Who ventured along with me? Whose hand could bear to thrust and grind that spike in Cyclops' eye when mild sleep had mastered him? As luck would have it, the men I would have chosen won the toss, four strong men, and I made five as captain. So they like um, took turns seeing who would be the ones to have to do this to Cyclops. And Odysseus and the men that he would have chosen who are already really strong got picked randomly. At evening came the shepherd with his flock, his woolly flock. The rams as well this time entered the cave. By some shepherding whim or a god's bidding, none were left outside. He hefted his great boulder into place and sat him down to milk the bleeding ewes in proper order, put the lambs to suck, and swiftly ran through all his evening chores. Then he caught two more men and feasted on them. My moment was at hand, and I went forward holding an ivy bowl of my dark drink, looking up, saying, Cyclops, try some wine. Here's liquor to wash down your scraps of men. Taste it and see the kind of drink we carried under our planks. I meant it for an offering if you would help us home, but you are mad, unbearable, a bloody monster. After this, will any other traveler come to see you? So he's giving Cyclops that wine that we talked about that was so powerful. Um, and Cyclops is drinking it and it's like really big bowls. Like it would be a lot of wine. He seized and drained the bowl, and it went down so fiery and smooth he called for more. Give me another, thank you kindly. Tell me, how are you called? I'll make a gift will please you. Even Cyclops know the wine grapes grow out of grassland and loam in heaven's rain, but here's a bit of nectar and ambrosia. So he's saying, the wine's really good. Um, I'm going to give you a gift. What's your name? Three bowls I brought him, and he poured them down. I saw the fuddle and flush come over him. Then I sang out in cordial tones, Cyclops, you ask my honorable name. Remember the gift you promised me, and I shall tell you. My name is Nobody, mother, father, and friends. Everyone calls me Nobody. So while Cyclops is getting drunk, this is a trick that Odysseus is playing on him. He has an idea for in the future why he wants Polyphemus to think his name is Nobody. So that's what Polyphemus thinks Odysseus's name is, Nobody. And now I'm at the top of 570. 
And he said, nobody's my meat then after I eat his friends. Others come first. There is a noble gift now. So that's the gift that Polyphemus gave him. That after everyone is done eating is when he'll eat Odysseus. That's his gift is that he'll eat him last. Even as he spoke, he reeled and tumbled backward, his great head lolling to one side, <clears throat> and sleep took him like any creature. Drunk hiccuping, he dribbled streams of liquor and bits of men. Now, by the gods, I drove my big hand spike deep in the embers, charring it again, and cheered my men along with battle talk to keep their courage up. No quitting now. <coughs> Excuse me. The pike of olive, green though it had been, reddened and glowed as if about to catch. I drew it from the coals, and my four fellows gave me a hand, lugging it near the cyclops as more than natural force nerved them. Straight forward they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it deep in his crater eye, and leaned on it, turning it as a shipwright tums a drill and planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that spins it in the groove. So with our brand we bored that great eye socket while blood ran out around the, around the red hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared, the pierced ball hissed broiling, and the roots popped. So there, they got the tree, the head, they'd made a, a spear out of basically into the fire, got it all hot while Cyclops was drunk and passed out. And then they burned it into his eye and twisted it around, and blood's coming out. And this is um, an example of imagery. So the author is using sensory words, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste to describe how brutal blinding Cyclops is and he's not done there's a little bit more now he's going to do what we call an extended metaphor so it's just a long metaphor comparing um poking Cyclops's eye out to uh forging a blade like in a in a blacksmith forge so I'm in the middle of 570 in a smithy one sees a white hot axe head or an adze plunged and wrung in a cold tub screeching steam the way they make soft iron hail and hard, just so that eyeball hissed around the spike. The cyclops bellowed and the rock roared round him and we fell back in fear. Clawing his face, he tugged the bloody spike out of his eye, threw it away, and his wild hands went groping. Then he set up a howl for cyclops who lived in caves on windy peaks nearby. Some heard him and they came by diverse ways to clump around outside and call, what ails you Polyphemus? Why do you cry so sore in the starry night? You will not let us sleep. Sure, no man's driving off your flock. No man has tricked you, ruined you. So this is where Odysseus's trick comes in. The other Cyclops can't see what's going on in Polyphemus's cave. And remember, they're not that smart. So when they ask him what's going on, he's about to say, nobody's trying to kill me. And to the Cyclops outside, it's like, well, no, nobody's doing anything to you. So at the top of 571. Out of the cave, the mammoth Polyphemus roared an answer, Nobody, nobody's tricked me, nobody's ruined me. To this rough shout, they made a sage reply, Ah, well, if nobody has played you foul there in your lonely bed, we are no use in pain given by great Zeus. Let it be your father, Poseidon Lord, to whom you pray. So they're like, Oh, well, if nobody's hurting you, then you must just be sick. That's the gods' area. You might as well pray to them. Pray to your dad, Poseidon. And then they left. So Odysseus's trick worked. So saying, they trailed away, and I was filled with laughter to see how like a charm the name deceived them. Now Cyclops, wheezing as the pain came on him, fumbled to wrench away the great door stone and squatted in the breach with arms thrown wide for any silly beast or man who bolted, hoping somehow I might be such a fool. But I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there huge. How could we slip away? I drew on all my wits and ran through tactics, reasoning as a man will for dear life until a trick came, and it pleased me well. The Cyclops' rams were handsome, fat with heavy fleeces, a dark violet. So Cyclops has opened the door to the cave, and he's kind of standing there with his arms out, trying to catch anyone who runs past him. Um, but Odysseus realizes that that would not be a good way out. Cyclops would catch him just because he's so big. And so they wait in the cave, and he's noticing that there are all these sheep that are really big and really fluffy, and so he's got a plan with the sheep. <clears throat> Three abreast, I tied them silently together, twining cords of willow from the ogre's bed, then slung a man under each middle one to ride there safely, shielded left and right. So three sheep could convey each man. I took the wooliest ram, the choicest of the flock, and hung myself under his kinky belly, pulled up tight, with fingers twisted deep in sheepskin ringlets for an iron grip. So, breathing hard, we waited until morning. 
So he has, um, for each of his sailors, he has three sheep kind of like strapped together and the men are hanging underneath the sheep so that you can't see them or feel them from the top. If you were to touch the bellies of the sheep, you would know that the men were there, but they know that Polyphemus is just gonna like pet the tops of the rams. So um, they'll be hidden underneath. So they're kind of just like hanging down there waiting for morning. When Dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, the rams began to stir, moving for pasture and peals of bleeding echoed round the pens where dams with udders full called for a milking. Blinded and sick with pain from his head wound, the master stroked each ram, then let it pass. But my men riding on the pectoral fleece, the giant's blind hands blundering never found. So here on 572, you can see a painting. Uh, Polyphemus is blinded, so he's touching the backs of these rams as they pass through, because he knows Odysseus and his men are trying to escape, but he can't feel that underneath the men are tied up under the rams and passing under that way. Top of 573. Last of them all, my ram, the leader, came, waited by wool and me with my meditations. The cyclops patted him, and then he said, sweet cousin ram, why lag behind the rest in the night cave? You never linger so, but graze before them all, and go afar to crop sweet grass, and take your stately way leading along the streams until at evening you run to be the first one in the fold. Why now so far behind? Can you be grieving over your master's eye? That carrion rogue and his accursed companions burnt it out when he had conquered all my wits with wine. Nobody will not get out alive, I swear. Oh, had you brain and voice to tell where he made me now, dodging all my fury. Bashed by this hand and bashed on this rock while his brains would strew the floor, and I should have rest from the outrage. Nobody worked upon me. So he's talking to his friend, the ram. He's sad. He's blind and in pain. He sent us into the open then. Close by, I dropped and rolled clear of the ram's belly, going this way and that to untie the men. With many glances back, we rounded up his fat, stiff-legged sheep to take aboard and drove them down to where the good ship lay. So they're um, stealing the sheep as they run away from Cyclops. And I'm on line 421. We saw as we came near our fellows' faces shining. Then we saw them turn to grief, tallying those who had not fled from death. I hushed them, jerking head and eyebrows up, and in a low voice told them, load this herd, move fast, and put the ship's head toward the breakers. They all pitched in at loading, then embarked and struck their oars into the sea. Far out, as far offshore as shouted words would carry, I sent a few back to the adversary. Oh, Cyclops, would you feast on my companions? Puny am I in a caveman's hands? How do you like the beating that we gave you, you damned cannibal? Eater of guests under your roof. Zeus and the gods have paid you. So Odysseus, as they row away from Cyclops, has like shouted back at him, like, na 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 na, I got you. And he tells him, you know, look what, look what you got for being rude to me. Even though Odysseus did kind of come into his cave without asking. I'm at the bottom of 573 now, line 436. The blind thing in his doubled fury broke a hilltop in his hands and heaved it after us. Ahead of our black prow, it struck and sank, whelmed in a spuming geyser, a giant wave that washed the ship stern foremost back to shore. So here's a painting. You can see the Cyclops, having heard Odysseus yell at him, grabs the top of a mountain like a giant boulder and throws it after the ship and it lands beyond the ship, which kind of pushes the ship back towards shore, back in danger of Cyclops. So they were safe from him and now they're close to him again. And his crew is gonna be like, shut up. I got the longest boat hook out and stood fending us off with furious nods to all to put their backs into a racing stroke, row, row or perish. So the long oars bent kicking the foam sternward, making head until we drew away and twice as far. Now when I cut my hands, I heard the crew in low voices protesting, God's sake, Captain, why bait the beast again? Let him alone. That tidal wave he made on the first throw all but beached us. All but stove us in. Give him our bearing with your trumpeting. He'll get the range and lob a boulder. Aye, he'll smash our timbers and our heads together. I would not heed them in my glorying spirit. <clears throat> so the crew's asking him not to yell at Cyclops again because he'll be able to hear them and throw another boulder at them and hit the ship or push them back to shore. And Odysseus is like, now nah, I'm still going to yell at him. Um, and I'm on page 574, if you lost me, uh, line 456. 
but let my anger flare and yell, Cyclops, if ever mortal man inquire how you were put to shame and blinded, tell him Odysseus, raider of cities, took your eye, Laertes' son, whose home's on Ithaca. Um, so he's telling him his real name now. And that's uh, an epithet next to Odysseus's name. So Odysseus, raider of cities, we have his name, and then a phrase that goes along with his name that's descriptive, that's an epithet. At this, he gave a mighty sob and rumbled, now comes the weird upon me, spoken of old. A wizard, grand and wondrous, lived here, Telemus, a son of Eurymus. Great length of days he had in wizardry among the Cyclops, and these things he foretold for time to come. My great eye lost, and at Odysseus's hands. Always I had in mind some giant, armed and giant force, would come against me here. But this, but you, small, pitiful, and twiggy, you put me down with wine, you blinded me. Come back, Odysseus, and I'll treat you well, praying the god of earthquake to befriend you. His son I am, for he by his avowal fathered me, and if he will, he may heal me of this black wound. He and no other of all the happy gods are mortal men. So when Odysseus tells Polyphemus his real name, Polyphemus remembers that this wizard that used to live on the island with them made a prophecy that someone named Odysseus would blind Polyphemus, but Polyphemus didn't think to be afraid of a human because he's so small. And then when he didn't tell him his name was Odysseus, he didn't think of it. So now he's like, oh, shoot, that was you. And he kind of says, come back. I'll pray to my father, Poseidon, to heal me, and I'll be nice to you. Um, and Odysseus is not interested in that. So I'm on the top of 575 now. Few words I shouted in reply to him. If I could take your life, I would, and take your time away, and hurl you down to hell. The god of earthquake could not heal you there. At this, he stretched his hands out in his darkness toward the sky of stars and prayed beside him. O oh, hear me, Lord, blue girdler of the islands, if I am thine indeed, and thou art father, grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, never see his home, Laertes' son, I mean, who kept his hall on Ithaca. Should destiny intend that he shall see his roof again among his family in his fatherland, far be that day, and dark the years between. Let him lose all companions and return under strange sail to bitter days at home. In these words he prayed, and the god heard him. So he's praying to his father, Poseidon, to curse Odysseus, even on top of the curse he already has, and make his life difficult, not let him get home, or if he does, make it a really long, terrible journey and have it, there be trouble waiting for him at home, which there is. We know we have some foreshadowing here because Odysseus says the god heard him, so he granted his prayer. Uh, line 495. Now he laid hands upon a bigger stone and wheeled around, titanic for the cast, to let it fly in the black proud vessel's track. But it fell short, just aft the steering oar, and whelming seas rose giant above the stone to bear us onward toward the island. So he threw another boulder, but this one didn't hit them, and it actually pushed them further away. So they're going to safety now. There as we ran in, we saw the squadron waiting, the trim ships drawn up side by side, and all our troubled friends who waited, looking seaward. We beached her, grinding keel in the soft sand, and waded in ourselves on the sandy beach. Then we unloaded all the Cyclops flock to make division, share and share alike, so they're eating Cyclops sheep. Only my fighters voted that my ram, the prize of all, should go to me. I slew him by the seaside and burned his long thigh bones to Zeus beyond the storm cloud, Cronus' son, who rules the world. But Zeus disdained my offering, destruction for my ships he had in, he had in store, and death for those who sailed them, my companions. So some more foreshadowing. He prayed to Zeus, um, but he says Zeus doesn't hear him. He's going to kill his sailors. Now all day long until the sun went down, we made our feast on mutton and sweet wine, till after sunset in the gathering dark, we went to sleep above the wash of ripples. I'm at the top of 576 now. When the young, do young dawn with fingertips of rose touched the world, I roused the men, gave orders to man the ships, cast off the mooring lines, and filing in to sit beside the rowlock oarsmen in line dipped oars in the great sea. So we moved out, sad in the vast offing, having our precious lives, but not our friends. So they've left Cyclops' land. They have lost some more crew members. <clears throat> and um, they're still in that three-year section, sort of at the beginning of the Odyssey. Uh, so when we pick up, we will read some more of the next section and I'll uh, summarize what happens next. So I'll see you.